Hello, everyone. My name is Tim Reber with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, which is hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in partnership with the United Nations Foundation's Energy Access Practitioner Network, the EU Energy Initiative Partnership Dialogue Facility, and Practical Action. Today's webinar is focused on building energy access markets with a focus on value chain analysis of key energy market systems. One important note of mention before we begin our presentation is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practices resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Doing so will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. If you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option and a box on the right side of the screen will display the telephone number and audio pin you should use to dial in. If anyone is having difficult technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinar Help Desk at 888-259-3826 for assistance. If you would like to ask a question, and we ask that you please do, you can use the questions pane also on the right side of the screen. You may type in your question directly. We have quite a few panelists today, so we ask that when you do ask questions, please try to indicate which panelist specifically you'd like to answer your question, or if more than one, you can indicate that as well. If you're having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, you will find PDF copies of the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training, and you may follow along as the speakers present. Also, an audio recording and the presentations will be posted to the Solutions Center training page within a few weeks and will be added to the Solutions Center YouTube channel. We will also find other informative webinars and video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. Today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentations from our guest panelists, Michael Franz, Charlie Miller, and Christopher Service. These panelists have been kind enough to join us today to showcase building energy access markets framework. This publication, developed by Practical Action Consulting, offers policymakers and practitioners a method for designing and delivering interventions that can achieve scale and sustainability and also features applicable case studies. Before our speakers begin their presentations, I will provide a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center initiative, and Jem Pokaro will provide a brief overview of the Energy Access Practitioner Network and Sustainable Energy for All. Then, following the presentations, we'll have a brief question and answer session where the panelists will address questions submitted by the audience, some closing remarks, and close with a short survey. This slide provides a bit of background in terms of how the Solutions Center came to be. The Solution Center is one of 13 initiatives of the Clean Energy Ministerial that was launched in April of 2011 and is primarily led by Australia, the United States, and other clean energy ministerial partners. Outcomes of this unique initiative include support of developing countries and emerging economies through enhancement of resources on policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools, such as the webinar you are attending today. The Solution Center has four primary goals. It serves as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. It serves to share policy best practices, data, and analysis tools specific to clean energy policies and programs. It delivers dynamic services that enable expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And finally, the Center fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation around the globe. Our primary audience is energy policy makers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries but we also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society. One of the marquee features of the Solution Center is the no-cost expert policy assistance known as Ask an Expert. The Ask an Expert program has established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are available to provide remote policy advice and analysis to all countries and no cost. For example, in the area of policy and market design, we are very pleased to have David Jacobs, director at the International Energy Transition, serving as one of our experts. If you have need for policy assistance in policy and market design or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this valuable service. Again, the assistance is provided free of charge. If you have a question for our experts, please submit it through our simple online form at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash experts. Or to find out how the Ask an Expert service can benefit your work, 
please contact Sean Esterly directly at sean.esterly at nrel.gov or at 303-384-7436. We also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. Now I'd like to go ahead and provide a brief introduction for today's panelists. First up today is Michael Franz. Michael is a Senior Advisor for Sustainable Energy and International Cooperation. He has extensive experience in working with donors, European commissions, private sector, development agencies, and financing institutions towards mobilizing investment in renewable energy and energy access projects. His work centers around the nexus of energy project development, policy frameworks, and financing with a geographic focus on Sub-Saharan Africa. Our second speaker today is Charlie Miller. Charlie is Head of Policy at SolarAid, an international NGO dedicated to eradicating the kerosene lamp through building the market for portable solar lights. Charlie co-chairs the Policy Working Group with the Global Off-Grid Lighting Association and sits on the steering committee of the Power for All campaign. He advises governments, aid agencies, foundations, and investors on policy, grant making, and investment in the off-grid energy space. And our final speaker today is Chris Service. Chris is a business developer at Foundation for Rural Energy Services, a Netherlands-based nonprofit that accelerates socioeconomic improvements in rural communities of developing sub-Saharan Africa through the rollout of a standardized fee-for-service model for rural electrification. And now with those three introductions, I'd like to go ahead and welcome Jem Procaro to the webinar for a brief overview of the Energy Access Practitioner Network and Sustainable Energy for All. Jem. Thanks, Jim. Uh, and thanks to everybody who's online who made it today. Um, again, I'm, I'm Jem Porcaro. I'm the Senior Director of, of Energy Access at the UN Foundation. And I just wanted to provide a, a very brief overview, as Tim mentioned, um, on sustainable energy for all and the Energy Access Practitioner Network, just to provide a little bit of context for the uh, presentations that you'll hear later on um, this morning or this afternoon. So uh, with that, uh, next slide, and, and uh, you can ignore the name on the, on the first slide. I'm not tripped it. That's my colleague uh, filling in today. So I probably don't need to uh, remind many of you online um, that a large swath of society still lacks access to modern energy services, both in the form of electricity, power, and uh, clean cooking solutions. And so in response to this issue, back in 2011, the UN, including the World Bank, came together to form and launch a new global initiative called Sustainable Energy for All, which was really meant to serve as a platform for mobilizing, coordinating a number of stakeholders, including governments, businesses, civil society, around three um, interrelated objectives. One was to ensure universal access to modern energy services. The other was to double the rate of improvement in energy efficiency. And the last was to double the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix, all by 2030. Um, obviously, a, a pretty ambitious um, set of goals, but um, goals nonetheless that have, in fact, since the adoption of Sustainable Energy for All are now set to be adopted within the new Sustainable Development Goals, um, which are taking the place of the Millennium Development Goals. So since the establishment uh, in 2011 of SE for All, um, they've, there's been a, a pretty good political win in the sense of having embedded these three goals within the next development framework uh, for the next 15 years. Uh, next slide. So since its establishment in 2011, um, I, I think this slide is slightly out of date, um, SE for All has mobilized a number of, of stakeholders, organizations to work together. Um, and in fact, I think there's somewhere in the order of about 106 countries, including the EU and the EU, um, who have partnered with Sustainable Energy for All. Uh, roughly 85 developing countries are now um, either working on or working towards the development of their own country action agendas and investment perspectives um, that are embedding and mainstreaming these three major goals within their own country's development plans and policies. 
Um, so that's encouraging news in terms of um, the breadth and scope that SE for All has, has been able to achieve in working with other countries and other governments. Next slide. So within Sustainable Energy for All, um, one of the resources within this global platform is something called the Energy Access Practitioner Network. And that's a network that the UN Foundation helps run uh, for SE for All. It is basically a network of roughly now over 2,000 practitioners working in the energy access space. Um, this network started in 2011 with roughly 20 members. So we've grown uh, quite rapidly from 20 to 2,000 in a, in a matter of just a few years. Um, the goals or the objectives of the network really are to promote new technologies, innovative financial business models, to provide a platform to convene and connect you know, a range of stakeholders around new partnerships as we are doing today. And, and lastly, to facilitate the development and adoption of new standards. Um, I should also mention that kind of the core focus of the network is primarily on market-led decentralized energy applications, all with the goal of, of, of trying to achieve universal energy access by 2030. Um, our membership is composed of roughly half of our members are small and medium enterprises. Uh, one quarter are larger enterprises, government agencies, academic institutions, and the other quarter is roughly uh, or are NGOs, international NGOs. Um, and there you can see um, um, where you can get a little bit more information about the, the network. And I should also just mention that we recently, as of a couple of days ago, launched a, a new website. So I encourage all those of you online who haven't seen our new website to please check out um, the URL provided here. Next slide. So with that, I think you know we just wanted to recognize, given given the the energy access challenge, um, and given that many of our members um, uh, focused on market-led approaches and some of the feedback that we've been hearing from our members who have voiced um, uh, a need for better access to supply chain and value chain information and reliable market business intelligence data. We very much welcome this, this presentation or these set of presentations today because I think it's, um, it's beginning to fill a void that uh, many of our practitioners and many of our members have uh, been requesting uh, assistance with. So um, with that, I think I'll conclude and, and I suppose hand it back over to Tim or Michael for now. Thanks, Jim. That was, uh, that was great. Certainly appreciate it. Um, without any further ado, then, I guess we'll just um, just move right on into uh, to Michael's presentation. Again, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to answer, uh, submit them through that questions pane and we'll get to all the questions um, at the end. So Michael, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thanks for the opportunity of, of making this presentation here. My name is Michael Franz. I work uh, for ERI IPDF. And I'm going to present to you today a publication that we uh, developed together and in cooperation with uh, Practical Action. Before we get there, I want to briefly introduce uh, who we are and what we do. Uh, EUEI PDF, which uh, stands for EU Energy Initiative Partnership Dialogue Facility which was founded in 2005 and we do mostly policy and strategy advisory, policy dialogue and we support energy market development through various activities. We've been doing many activities. I actually encourage you to go to our website. Um, almost all the projects that we've been doing over the years are, are documented there. There's plenty of publications. I should mention at this point our donors. Uh, this study was also uh, financed by somebody and uh, European uh, the EUI PDF is supported by Austria, the European Commission, Finland, France, Germany, the Netherlands, and Sweden. We're hosted by GIZ, and that makes me also a GIZ staff member. Now let's go into the content. Uh, what I'm going to present today is essentially a publication uh, that we did. Uh, it's 
It's called Building Energy Access Markets, a value chain analysis of key energy market systems. And this is the link uh, where you can download the study. It's quite a bulky document, but uh, you can have it in uh, soft copy and hard copy, but I'm going to get to that. Let me briefly talk about why we actually did that. And I have some questions here that, that, that inspired us, but it was uh, very much also an, an, an encounter which is symbolic for many of such discussions that we have. It was a conversation about three and a half years ago that I had with one of our uh, donors who is a decision maker uh, uh, and they're involved in, or at that point they were starting a, a very large programming exercise uh, for very substantial funds to support energy in the development context. And he said, Michael, we need something to help us understand better how the markets work and where those points are, those leverage points, where our interventions can actually make a difference. And we went back with that and as a result of that we came up with, uh, with this, uh, with this uh, product. We studied then uh, extensively existing literature and of course a lot has been done. There are fantastic uh, publications uh, out there already. Uh, there's also a great uh, study, for example, by AIFC that was done with a similar uh, scope. The difference is, however, that um, often the recommendations in terms of we need this or we need that, we need, were too generic. Um, it was said that we need an enabling environment or we need a specific element, but it wasn't exactly clear where it relates explicitly to the way people do business out there in the markets. And that's what we tried to overcome. So we got together with uh, Frank and Collection, who are very renowned and have extensive experience in this field, came up with a publication with three objectives. One, to improve the understanding of how markets work and looking at the markets in a systemic way. Then identifying barriers for market development and success factors that can be addressed to help develop the markets. And then identify uh, interventions to promote market uptake. And the approach that we followed is that we really put the doing business perspective in, in, in the center by focusing on the value chains, by then developing and applying a PM framework, and then by applying this framework to five market segments and validating it through case studies. So just to be clear, the, 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 the target group here, the, the main target group is the likes actually of ourselves, um, me working in the development agency, but also our own donors. It's those that design support interventions, that those that have an interest in figuring out how to better uh, support markets. Of course, it's also helpful for people who are doing business in the markets, who have, want to have a tool that helps them understand the market they're operating in a more system, a systematic way or anyone else uh, who has an interest. But that is our primary uh, target group. And let me start off with this because this shows um, the generic framework that we uh, apply where we have in the center the market chain, the value chain, which you could see going from the left to the right. And then we have the enabling environment where we again categorized into three factors and I'm going to explain all these factors briefly that is on top, and at the bottom uh, we have uh, another level that comprises inputs, services, and financing. And what we try to highlight here with those various arrows that go up or down is that there are very specific concrete elements in those levels that relate to specific points in the value chain. And that's where it really becomes interesting because that's where we then can achieve a greater understanding as to how things actually work. I want to briefly run you through this. In essence, a value chain in the, in the graph, it runs from the left uh, to the right, where you could say on the left, energy or energy products, energy services are being produced and then they travel downstream to the end users eventually, uh, which can imply manufacturing or generation and the distribution by one way or another, retail by one way or another, and eventually the consumption of energy, services, or products. This, is, this was the center of the value chain. And then what we had uh, down and at the downside of, of that graph, there are inputs that are required by the uh, actors. Those would be concrete, tangible goods. It can be also fuels. We would have services 
for example, repair and maintenance service, transport service, training, or even information. And then, of course, the various types of finance. And you all would probably appreciate that there's many different uh, types of finance at the level of the end user. You would need a specific type of finance at the level of uh, a company in the value chain. It would be a very different type of finance. That's what we try to capture with this. And then we have the third level, which is uh, the enabling environment, where we again differentiate it in political and regulatory factors, the rules, the law, the rules of the game, so to say. And then social this behavior, cultural practices, cooking practices, uh, for example. And last but not least, fact, financial and uh, economic factors, income levels, ability to pay, the level of local uh, economic activity, and so on and so forth. So, if that is all put together, one, and I will illustrate this uh, using an example, one can arrive at a specific understanding how a market segment looks like. But then that is, of course, only uh, the first part. The second part would then be to identify barriers in each market systems. And what we try to do is then we uh, develop a, a system of highlighting those barriers, of categorizing them, of, and then importantly also of categorizing support interventions. We found this, or we were hoping that this would be useful because it would help us have an understanding of a toolbox, if you will, a generic toolbox that many of us, I suppose, will be deploying in their work. Um, we followed uh, distinguish, uh, we distinguish between technical assistance and financial assistance uh, interventions. And then uh, where there's, again, different types that we can do. We can train people on hard technical issues, but then a business development training would be something else. Policy support is also technical uh, assistance, as well as advocacy support or awareness raising uh, support. And then in the financial assistance, you have typical interventions such as loans, equity, grants, which are quite different, uh, obviously, in nature, or complementary financing instruments. In any case, we put this all together, and uh, you're most welcome to look at uh, the publication to see how it turns out. I'm just going to give you a few examples uh, as well. And then we applied this framework two different market segments. And yes, this is actually something that I have come to uh, believe is, is very important and uh, has also can also be a source of uh, frustration uh, in some of the discourses, some of the meetings, when the categories that we are talking about are too broad. When, for example, one is talking about energy markets or renewable energy as such. Whereas in reality, what we actually have is specific market segments that have demand and supply structures in common, that have rules and regulations in common, that have business models in common. And it's very useful to analyze things at the level of the market segment, which is what we try to do, because only then we will arrive at a specific understanding of how exactly things come together. We could have covered more market segments, but we chose to go for these. Uh, mini grids, essentially, solar home systems, uh, solar PV lanterns, meaning even smaller solar PV systems, biomass cook stoves and fuels, and last but not least, LPG. And then here on the right side of the screen, you can see that so the market maps uh, that reside look quite different. Here's an example. This is how we came, uh, how we described, how we set out the, 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 the mini grid market map, uh, which is essentially describing uh, a market system or mini grids where you have uh, the development of the project and then the operations which entail generation, distribution and retailing and then the consumption at the level of households, enterprises or public sector in the value chain. And then you have in the enabling environment you have the various, everyone know mini grids uh, are uh, an aspect that does require uh, good regulation and attractive frameworks. Incidentally, I should mention at this point, we also have a publication that is looking into this in greater detail. It's called the Mini Grid Policy Tool, in case you're interested. But anyway, in any case, and then what we try to do, as you can see from this graph, is that we try to explain exactly where, exactly which element becomes relevant. And we did the same for uh, input services and finance. Uh, and just to highlight here, for example, you can see that we distinguish between three types of finance. There's money that is needed in order to get the mini-grid project off the ground in the first place. There's money needed uh, during operations, depending on the business model, obviously, but uh, that could be the case. And then there's also money at the level of the end user. 
uh, again, it depends on the business model at the end of the day. And on the basis of this, uh, this slide here tries to illustrate, it's basically screenshots from uh, the book, the booklet. Uh, so there's actually quite a long list uh, of issues that need to be in place. And then we try to describe how the interventions could look like, uh, who the responsible actors uh, are in the lead. And the color coding that you can see here corresponds again with the type of uh, with the level uh, identified in the market map. Again, I, I, it's, it would be too too much for this presentation to go into detail into great detail here. I just want to describe to you how the model works, and you're welcome to explore it uh, uh, for yourself. We then had a number of case studies. Um, from the mini grid realm, from the solar PV lantern, biomass cooking stove, LPG fuels, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And the two presenters uh, um, after me, uh, Christopher and Charlie, are going to, well, also, I mean, they're, they're representing actors that were featuring as, uh, as case studies in this uh, project. This is then, for example, how, uh, the, based on the interviews that we had, how the market system map for foundation rural energy service uh, looks like uh, for solar PV, uh, solar home systems. And then uh, we're going to hear more about this. I would encourage you, uh, if you have the, this option, to perhaps have the, uh, this, this graph there while uh, our colleague goes through his presentation later, so that you can see how the one corresponds with the other. And then the same for, for, for Solar 8, which is also operating the Pico PV uh, market. Where then this is the value chain, essentially, the way it is described, and the various relevant factors in the, in the two levels. Yeah. So I just want to wrap up, and then uh, and we can go into the case studies. Just to be clear, we didn't try to come up with a blueprint here. There is no such thing uh, as a, a blueprint. It's meant as a tool to help understand how markets work, that we can all work with, that we can adapt to our own needs. That also means that uh, it's not perfect uh, and it's, it's subjective to a certain extent. Uh, one could have probably renamed some of those boxes. One could have put the arrows in slightly different places uh, in one instance or another. But the idea is, again, not to come up with a blueprint, but to help us. Uh, give us some tool at hand uh, to, to, to better understand. Following two perspectives, and they came out from my presentation, I hope that on the one hand, we do need a holistic uh, perspective that we want to build markets, that we want to achieve dynamic market development, otherwise we are not going to close the energy access gap, and that this uh, Aaron Leopold of Practical Action Court is the complexity that we need to address, and he's very right with that. Yeah, it's it's unfortunately in many cases we need many things to be in place at the same time, and it's important that we have them on the radar, and we hope that uh, this framework helps with that. But at the same time, to have a differentiated uh, perspective, not to be too general, to be specific, to not be afraid of breaking down the complexity into its components, understanding the value chains in their distinct market segments and their specific barriers, the specific needs, and the specific requirements. Because only, only through this we can actually then take the big problems, break them down into manageable problems, which can then be addressed. Something that we also realized, and I have seen that in our work, uh, we, can have, we can see similarities between markets. We can see synergies for doing business uh, in the Energy and Development Program uh, run by GIZ. We have uh, seen that, that, that there can be great synergies, for example, between cooking stoves and solar lighting products, because we're talking about basically the same, uh, the same uh, people at the demand uh, level, the same beneficiaries, uh, similar, similar looking structures and market systems. There can be synergies explored here. Last but not least, this publication is free to use for anyone. Feel free also to request uh, hard copies for us, from us, and we see what we can do. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to questions. Great. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, interesting, uh, interesting piece of work there. Looking forward to, to uh, reading the full report. Um, without any further ado, we'll, uh, we'll just keep moving right ahead. Again, uh, a couple of questions here, but uh, we'll be putting those off uh, and then addressing them all at the end. So we'll go ahead and hand it over to Charlie, um, who's going to give us a bit of insight into uh, how the framework uh, looks on the ground. Um, 
looking at solar rate. So, Charlie, whenever you're ready. Many thanks. My name is Charlie Miller. I'm representing solar aid. Solar aid is a UK-based NGO that runs Sunny Money. Uh, Sunny Money has, for the last three years, been the, um, the largest distributor of solar lights by volume in Africa. It's, uh, it's a business that is wholly owned by the charity and uh, wholly grant funded. Its, it's um, reason for existing is, is not to make money necessarily, it's to, um, it's to catalyze the market. It's to go and sell lights in places where no one else is selling them and to create trust and demand and market momentum. Uh, but first a little bit on our history. Sorry, I'm just trying to get to the next slide here. What, what's going on? Charlie, if you try clicking um, on the slide, it might advance it. Oh, uh, there we go. Um, so um, we built Sunny Money in 2011, recognizing that there were the three kind of key barriers to, to the growth of the portable solar lighting market. We were seeing all this money going into the research and development for new portable solar technologies. We were seeing the price coming down dramatically. I think probably in particular the launch of the D-Lite S2, uh, the S1, sorry, back in 2011 or so, um, was um, a real game changer in terms of offering a direct replacement for a kerosene lamp at uh, around $10, which was a price point that put modern energy for lighting uh, within reach of people living below $1.25 a day. Uh, we're probably very distinctive um, when compared to the other um, actors in the off-grid lighting market because our customer base, 90% of them live below $1.25 a day. And a particular kind of social mission for us, a particular focus for us, is ensuring that even the poorest get access to modern energy products and services. So we um, are very focused on the affordability issue, both in terms of working with manufacturers to develop cheaper and cheaper quality products, and um, now more and more working with um, developers on um, building out the pay-as-you-go market segment, which has had traction for a while um, with, with wealthier customers, but which increasingly um, you know, is, is, is working its way downwards. We have, uh, for example, an entry-level um, uh, pay-as-you-go light, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, there were probably key two, the other two key areas here, awareness and access, were the areas where um, we were able to, to uncover a couple of core innovations that enabled us to achieve the scale that we've been able to achieve. Um, firstly, I think um, it's well recognized that, um, that cost is a major barrier, affordability is a major barrier. Um, and indeed, when I speak to policymakers, a lot of the time, that's the issue that they choose to focus on. But the flip side of how much someone is prepared to pay for something is, is how badly they want it. So our model is very much focused on um, getting trusted members of the local community, uh, in our case head teachers, um, to promote solar lights amongst um, their social networks, amongst the, the parents of the students in their schools. and. Um, talking about training people to talk about the benefits in terms of increased study hours, in terms of cost savings, uh, in terms of well-being, has, um, has proven to be a highly effective way to create demand. So, you know, we have a, a below-the-line marketing strategy which is very light on activities like radio or TV or any of those conventional marketing techniques that are more appropriate to a later stage of market development or to a wealthier customer segment or to a more dense population, we're very much focused on demonstrating products to people face to face, uh, having the people do those demonstrations, being trusted members of the local community, and um, enabling people to hear about the benefits firsthand from people they trust. So really all about that social peer-to-peer -peer, um, um, marketing which, uh, which proves really effective in, in this kind of um, rural context. And then I think the final, the final issue was, was um, availability or, or, or lack of access. You know, how far does someone have to go to buy a light? Um, we um, first discovered our, our kind of core innovation on this front um, on Matthew Island in Tanzania, where we were trying to get rid of some stock quickly, and somebody had this idea of going around the schools and working with the head teachers to promote solar lights. Um, and then um, 
you know, we, we had an idea which was instead of visiting every school, driving around in a jeep from village to village, we could bring the head teachers together. So now our, our core kind of, our first route to market in an area where there is zero market penetration involves bringing a group of anywhere up to about, up to 100 head teachers together and training them to promote solar lights. Uh, they will then go back to their communities and um, take orders. So unlike a, a, a traveling salesman, a head teacher is able to, to take payment off a family before delivering the product. And they are able to come and meet us at a central point later on and pick up anywhere from 50 to 100 lights at a time. Um, so for example, our, our top performing head teachers have taken uh, upwards of 2,000 lights off us and distributed them both in their own communities and in the surrounding communities. Um, I, I guess I would flag that population density is still a big constraint. Um, the number of head teachers that we're able to bring together in Kenya or Tanzania is much higher than the number of head teachers that we're able to bring together in somewhere like Zambia. So um, population density is still a real kind of constraint when it comes to making it um, viable to, to do this kind of model and to achieve the kinds of volumes that you need to make it um, viable as a, as a business opportunity. So um, yes, the school campaigns are a loss leading channel. They are not attractive to commercial companies. Um, that's why the, the work that we do is, is grant funded. Um, and as I say, it's not, the goal is not necessarily to, um, to become intensely profitable ourselves, it's to crowd in others. So I guess what we're really proud of in Kenya and Tanzania is that we went to places where no one else was selling lights, we seeded those markets, um, we got three, five percent of the village using solar lights, they all told their friends and neighbors um, that face-to-face -face experience and that customer endorsement effect created demand at a massive scale and that was demand that other people were able to, um, to serve. So we created demand and we crowded in a lot of other more conventional private companies into those rural markets for the first time. And I guess just something to highlight at this point is um, this quote from Off-Grid Electric, one of the leading solar as a service companies in Tanzania. Um, saying that even they have found it much easier to sell a full solar as a service model for large solar home systems in areas where um, the use of entry level solar lighting is commonplace. So that market catalyzing effect is, is not just about creating demand for products, it's also about creating demand for solar technology in general right the way through to full solar as a service models. And um, you know we very much see entry level lighting as a gateway technology um, which paves the way for a much broader range of products and services um, and establishes trust that creates demand for that whole range of products and services and not, um, not by any means an end in itself. So I've already talked a bit about the, the school campaigns. The school campaigns, rolling them out in Kenya and Tanzania was what enabled us to emerge as the largest distributor of solar lights in Africa. Um, we've also rolled them out in Zambia and Malawi but um, have had a very different experience. I think um, you know, in Zambia, because of the low population density, um, creating demand hasn't been enough to really crowd in other actors to many of the rural areas where we're operating. And in Malawi, um, we have a VAT and tariff policy on solar lights that renders lights um, unaffordable to many in one of the poorer countries in Africa. So you know, we thought that we'd stumbled across something that um, could play a big role in catalyzing markets, and that has indeed proven to be the case. I think it's well recognized that um, we've played a significant part in driving the emergence of the Kenyan and Tanzanian success stories. But equally, um, our experience in some other countries has shown us the limitations of, of that model in isolation, and um, just highlighted some of those other things that, um, that need to be addressed if we are to crowd in others, if we're to extend value chains into those more remote rural areas. Um, notably around affordability and um, just the, the question of population density and how do you serve those really remote communities in a way that's commercially viable. Um, we have in our more developed markets um, transitioned away from school campaigns entirely now. Head teachers are not the most natural um, entrepreneurs. And indeed, in Kenya, for example, about 80% of our lights are now sold through, through agents. 
Um, so those agent, that agent network started out being dominated by head teachers, but over time transitioned to more uh, naturally entrepreneurial people like local shopkeepers, for example. And um, that agent network continues to evolve with um, you know, um, anyone having the opportunity to, to become an agent if they can afford to um, access our bulk pricing that we offer to, to anyone. And um, what we've seen is quite a bit of turnover at the beginning with agent recruitment, but eventually a sort of a cream of the crop emerging through regularly achieving sales and regularly coming back to buy more stock. Um, and now some of our agents delivering really very significant volumes and um, having their own networks of sub-agents that they work through. Um, I guess just to flag another kind of constraint there is um, as, as those agents have got bigger, um, we've become more and more acutely aware of um, agent financing as a key constraint. The, um, the cost of financing for, for agents through traditional microfinance institutions is so high that um, generally they're not able to access finance. And uh, we've been looking at ways to do that ourselves, but um, it's not our core business. And um, obviously there's significant risk involved. So agent financing is an area where we're kind of actively looking for solutions that both piggyback on the, on the downstream um, chain, but um, also outside of that through um, distributor finance facilities and things like that. Finally, um, just this point about driving demand, I think very similar to the mobile phone market, um, we don't see um, off-grid energy as a, a one-product game. Um, the value really comes in building a brand that people trust uh, so that they come back to you for their second and their third product. And um, you know, strategically, it's um, core to what we're doing at the moment, um, moving people up the, the energy ladder. So going from an entry-level light to a pay-as-you-go light, um, moving from entry level to mid level or even to full solar home systems and full solar as a service. So our product mix over time has, has evolved from being 99% entry level lights to quite a bit less than that with some of these um, higher margin, um, higher, um, sorry, higher value, higher margin products um, that are going to help us to, to get sunny money to sustainability in the long term. Um, I think at this point I just wanted to flag some of the things we're doing at the bottom end of the market. We're very focused on um, ensuring that, that as off-grid energy markets grow, um, they become more and more inclusive and even poor people, poorer people are, more and more poorer people are able to, to access modern, modern energy for lighting. And this is just one example. We've worked with Angazda Design and Greenlight Planet to develop um, the first ever pay-as-you-go study light which retails for around um, $12 or $13. So a bit more expensive than a conventional study light, but people are able to pay for it in um, weekly or monthly installments over a period of about three months. And um, the incentive to repay is quite strong because after three months of repayments, um, the product is unlocked for three years. So um, we don't have to do extensive due diligence. We've seen um, that it produces a significant boost to uptake when we're selling these kinds of products and uh, that the default rates are acceptable. Um, you know, the opportunity presented by entry-level and mid-level pay-as-you-go for our businesses is significant, both in terms of addressing affordability and enabling customers to move up the energy ladder. But um, you know, there are certain kind of key components that we still need to lock down if we're going to take this kind of um, model to scale. Notably, the, the implicit offer of consumer finance involved in delivering services rather than products and payment in installments rather than upfront. Um, so, you know, I imagine over the next six months to a year or so, we'll be actively seeking a consumer finance partner to, to help us do that consumer lending. Um, now that the model is, um, has demonstrated its potential, I think. Um, also, this is a really interesting area, sort of sector-wide, I think. Um, we've seen um, pay-as-you-go attracting most of the investment in the industry, uh, led by the likes of Off-Grid Electric and Copa at the upper end. Um, but increasingly, I think the investors are seeing the opportunity to build out the pay-as-you-go market segment downwards. And um, it's really, really exciting, as I say, both in terms of a solution to the affordability issue and helping people move up the energy ladder. Um, I won't dwell on this slide for very long. I'm sure um, the people on this call are familiar with the idea of an energy ladder. Um, but I wanted to highlight the research that has come out of the um, Consultative Group Against Poverty and the Global Mobile Association, 
over the last sort of year or so, which we presented back at Sustainable Energy for All in New York in May, um, demonstrating clear positive relationships, symbiotic relationships between um, access to off-grid electrification and access to finance and access to mobile. And the data being generated by the pay-as-you-go companies is extraordinary in terms of people being able to demonstrate repayment, people de-risking themselves for future lending, people accessing consumer finance at interest rates significantly lower than traditional microfinance. And then similarly, those pay-go companies both um, you know, operating in areas where there is access to mobile and mobile money, um, which really helps in terms of collecting payments. But equally, a lot of people, I mean, for example, in our Malawi tests of pay-as-you-go, a lot of people experiencing mobile money for the first time as a result of buying a pay-as-you-go light. So uh, the symbiotic relationship where by selling these um, mobile-enabled pay-go um, products, we can um, contribute to the development of related markets and benefit from the development of those markets. Um, in case anyone is in any doubt about the existence of the energy ladder, I just wanted to bring up um, this slide which shows um, Lighting Africa statistics for um, market segmentation in Kenya over the course of 2014. Um, I think we always knew this would happen, but we had never seen any robust evidence that it would happen. Um, but literally in a six-month period over the course of 2014, we saw the proportion of entry-level products nearly half from 60 to 35%. We saw the proportion of mid-level products double from 26 to 53 percent, and the emergence of this new market segment, which is pay-as-you-go, um, which is only going to get bigger in time, you know, since it's attracting most of the investment that's coming into the industry um, at this time. So really very, very exciting developments, and, and, and we're very proud to have played a, a, an important role in that through seeding the market with entry-level lights just to get this whole um, process off the ground. Um, and I think, you know, again, worth emphasizing that, that we feel we've played a big role, but um, probably none of, none of the success in Kenya and Tanzania would have been possible were it not for the 0% VAT and tariffs, which were so critical to making lights affordable. Um, when Kenya's new government came in, um, I think it was about 18 months ago, uh, they reinstated the VAT and tariffs, and all the companies had to put the cost of their lights up by exactly that amount. So 100% of that VAT was passed on to the consumer. And then um, it was very gratifying to see that when the VAT um, exemption was reinstated, 100% of that cost reduction was also passed on to the consumer. So just really, really highlighting the importance of the right policy um, in, um, to be in place to ensure the lights are affordable. Um, as I said, um, you know, we really are very proud of what we've done in Kenya, Kenya and Tanzania. Um, we've tried to do the same thing in Malawi and Zambia and Uganda, and um, the results are, are much more mixed. And, and I think as I touched on at the beginning, it just highlights the importance of some of these other factors relating um, in particular to affordability, but also basic demographic factors like um, population density and how important um, they can be. And um, we've also, I think, just heard about some of the other really exciting innovations in support for off-grid electrification, notably the, um, the distributor finance facility that the World Bank has been running with the Development Bank of Ethiopia, and um, you know the fact that they've got a, a six-month waiting list to access that facility because it's proven so popular, and um, really, really fascinated to see that you know that effort to, to really overcome the, the, um, the, the finance bottleneck amongst distributors has proven to be really effective as well. So very, very much interested in, um, in understanding what these be best practices are and understanding kind of, you know, where we're best placed as a market actor to deliver on some of these innovations and overcome some of these challenges, but also just acutely aware of where it's not, it's not our natural role to play and where, you know, others clearly have a big role to play. Um, so challenges and opportunities. Um, I think we've been victims of our own success to a certain extent in Kenya and Tanzania. Um, we have helped to create demand, but in such a price-sensitive market, we've seen a huge influx of non-quality verified um, solar lights. And um, it's not actually a function of customer awareness of the quality issue. Our agents are saying that they sell the non-quality products side by side with the quality ones, and it's simply a function of price. That even though you know buying a quality light, even a basic entry level light, is a is a step change in someone's quality of life, saving them 15% of household income, 
um, even buying a non-quality light is still um, a really good idea when compared to the alternative of using kerosene batteries or candles. So, um, you know, we've been saying, you know, maybe we need to maybe we need to stay and take a stand for quality because otherwise the poorer customer segment that we serve will have no choice but to buy poorer quality products. Um, maybe there's a big risk of market spoilage, but um, I think until now we haven't really seen market spoilage um, having an impact um, on, on the market growth rates in Kenya and Tanzania, which if anything are accelerating all the time. So um, yeah, there's this question around, around the value of, uh, well, around, whether, around quality and the importance of quality and whether market spoilage is really happening or whether you know, a genuine choice between quality and non-quality is, um, is something that you know, the market can live with, if you like, for the time being. Uh, we've seen intense competition as a result of crowding in others. Um, the model, as I say, is loss leading, particularly the school campaigns. So um, we've been um, surprised by the speed with which that has happened and have had to adjust accordingly by going to other areas where, where other people aren't selling lights. For example, in Kenya at the moment, our strategy is very much to move away from the well-served areas and to go to the parts of the country where um, other people aren't, aren't selling lights, focusing on what we're best at. And then finally, as I said, um, the energy ladder, um, recognizing that affordability is still a major issue amongst our customer segment and um, recognizing that the real commercial value comes not in the energy level light, but in the customer journey and in and to deliver uh, much higher levels of functionality for, um, you know, for, for, um, and higher margins for our business. And then finally, just to, just to circle back on um, the Malawi example, which is the one that was included in the EUEI PDF um, publication, um, I think the key thing we learned there is that our work is, is really not sufficient in itself. So we've been, um, we've been focusing on how to overcome the affordability issue in Malawi, testing our entry-level pay-as-you-go products there in a, in a place which doesn't have an, a built mobile money market because um, you know, we think that's where it has the greatest potential to, to unlock volumes and um, to, to deliver significantly increased sales and to, to build out the market to enable even poorer people to, to access modern energy for lighting. And then relating to that, um, about 18 months ago, we started looking quite hard at um, how to do something about the VAT and tariff issue. Uh, we very much welcomed the World Bank's um, efforts to re-establish a renewable energy industry association in Malawi and um, we're looking at establishing our own kind of pico solar um, caucus within that with a specific view to addressing the VAT and tariff issue. And then thinking at a global level, um, as an NGO we also do other um, activities to support the market as a whole. Um, it looks like we're about to embark on a piece of research with UNDP to, to try and demonstrate to governments that they can save money through um, save money on kerosene subsidies through um, policies that promote off-grid lighting market growth. So trying to win that kind of macroeconomic argument, that fiscal argument, that um, counterintuitively not charging VAT on this technology will actually benefit the balance of payments and not um, cost it anything. Um, and with that, I think um, I would just like to touch on um, the core question that Michael answered right at the beginning. Why are 80% of solar light sales taking place in just three countries? I mean, if we were to highlight two or three really key drivers of that, we would um, say the zero VAT and tariffs was one, and the product demonstration at scale, which we were able to help with in Kenya and Tanzania, uh, really did help to pave the way for, for everything that came after it, and um, to help overcome that affordability issue by making people want lights more um, and be prepared to pay more for them. And then um, the distributor finance facility, which has um, clearly catalyzed a lot of businesses and helped people achieve a lot more sales over in Ethiopia. Um, I think probably one of the, the concerning trends is that um, as the off-grid lighting industry gets more and more dominated by pay-as-you-go companies, those companies require a certain level of client density in order to operate. Um, it's, it's really extraordinary what they're doing and the level of energy access they're delivering to people who've not been able to, to access um, that kind of energy before. But um, there, is a kind of a, there is a market concentration effect that's happening as a result of the emergence of PAYGO. And I think in particular, 
everybody's so focused on, on being industry-led, responding to the demands of the market actors, that um, we're seeing a divergence of what we're hearing from, from customers who are operating in countries, who are in countries um, that are not attractive to commercial players, like Malawi. They're telling us one thing, and then the industry players that are talking about the barriers in those more developed markets are really saying something quite different. So I guess a key focus for us going forward and something that we'd be keen to, um, you know, to, to see integrated into the use of this kind of, um, this kind of framework that EIA, EIPDF has developed is, um, is the voices of those in energy poverty themselves. Because um, you know, when, when, when they're in an area that, that the industry is not actively seeking to enter because there are just so many barriers, um, they, they will actually have something quite different to say Compared to compared to the the main off-grid lighting companies, so that divergence and that concentration is really fascinating. Um, with that, I'll close. I think I've probably talked a little too long, but um, many thanks. All right, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Charlie. Some uh, some really great work you guys are are doing there, and we've got quite a few questions. Hopefully, we'll have some time to get to. Um, if not, we'll send those along and, and let you answer them by email. Um, but uh, in the meantime, we'll move right on to, to Christopher, who's going to tell us about Foundation for Rural Energy Services. Christopher, uh, yes, you, good afternoon, everyone. Oh. Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Excellent. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, firstly, Charlie, thank you uh, for your presentation. Very interesting to hear what you guys are doing and also um, the focus you had on the energy access ladder, which I think is a critical part which is often overlooked uh, in many aspects of the industry. Uh, so today I'll be introducing uh, Frizz and our experience with decentralized energy access in sub-Saharan Africa. I know uh, Michael's um, value change analysis focused on a case study in Mali, so I'll present a little bit about that experience as well. So who are we? We're a Netherlands-based foundation looking to accelerate rural electrification in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the reason we do this is obviously for socio-economic development purposes. So our mission is essentially to provide electricity to rural off-grid areas of developing country, countries, principally by the use of solar energy. How we do this in practice is by establishing local utility companies in rural areas. So we go into the company, uh, into the country, establish a local commercial company, hire a general manager, and then together we roll out a standardized fee-for-service business model, which is essentially designed to be replica replicatable, uh, scalable, and ultimately sustainable as well. It's a commercial approach with a focus on households and small enterprises in terms of our market segmentations and I guess the energy access ladder. We're looking to provide electricity to those beyond basic lighting. So we're not talking the poor of the poor, but uh, the slightly better off poor, if you will. Uh, and so we're looking to support income generating activities and productive use activities. Uh, before I go any further, a quick shout out to our industry spokesperson. So the Alliance for Rural Electrification is based in Brussels and represents the decentralized energy sector by supporting its members with target advocacy and facilitating access to funding. Uh, a quick example of this would be uh, they recently had a, they launched a call for proposals with the OPEC Fund for Development and uh, in the implementation phase of that. But I would encourage anyone who is interested to know more about their energy, uh, energy access in Africa, Asia, or developing countries in general to get in touch with ARE as well as the uh, Practitioners Network to discuss these issues. Uh, so just a quick summary of where we are, the scale we're working, which countries, and what we've achieved to date. Uh, so Frez, in a nutshell, is working in, in five countries. We've got five companies in the country specified with roughly 230 local staff who in turn uh, contract work to uh, another 98 staff. We have a customer base combined of 33,000 people, uh, 33,000 customers, be them uh, businesses, institutions, and households. And in total, I think we have 3.3 .3 megawatt of installed solar capacity. Uh, a 
just a bit of a fine tuning on the evolution of the customer base since our establishment 2001 as you can see uh, SHS customers remain our core customers and from 2006 you can see the evolution of many good customers coming through Again, the installed solar capacity follows that of the customers and uh, what you will see is there was a dry patch from roughly 2006 to 2010 where there was really an absence of, of funding and we used the, that time to do a lot of market research in which countries we wanted to operate and where we wanted to go to from there. Uh, from 2011, we started to expand and, and started up three new companies in 2008 11 and 12 in Burkina Faso, Uganda and Guinea-Bissau and with that comes the growth that you see in the PV capacity and the customers. So getting into the details, uh, the FRES business model, as I mentioned we're a fee-for-service business model which essentially is providing electricity as a service rather than selling it as a product through uh, solar home systems or solar lights. Uh, key elements of the model is it it's a commercial model. It's, uh, it's designed to create a profit where it's affordable to the end user, uh, but it's also sustainable to the local company. So local companies are maintaining ownership of the systems, therefore installation, maintenance, and most essentially replacements of key components such as uh, charge controllers and most importantly batteries. So the key element of that is if the lights go off, if the battery shuts down, then you know who to call and who will come and replace it. So a customer essentially pays, uh, pays a monthly fee uh, starting from six euros for the entry level and that gives them access to electricity with no extra hidden fees, for example maintenance. If your battery breaks, we're there to replace it at no extra cost. Another key element of the business model is the, uh, the local ownership and with that I mean uh, we employ locals, we train locals so that the full suite of activities from installation, marketing, management of the company and its, uh, and its uh, solar home systems and all the technical specs are maintained at the local level. This is just a quick overview of where FRES works in the value chain. So we are essentially involved from the initial research, be it uh, from our own initiation or at the request of governments onto desk research, market research and essentially the development of a business plan. With that in mind, we search out the financiers and get to the point where we can implement and monitor and adjust the company as necessary. So the technologies, we operate two core technologies, solar home systems and mini grids. Uh, solar home systems remain our core product they're modular by design, uh, so we have our entry level system is an 80 watt peak system up to 320 watt peak system. And to give you an idea of where most of the customers sit, uh, it's generally in the range of the, the second tier up, which would be 160 watt peak. Uh, I'll tie on to the, the idea of growth and demand a bit later, but it, we have seen significant growth from when we started in 2001 until today's current current level. The other technology we use is mini grids. So at the moment we're operating 10 mini grids specifically in Mali. Seven of them are hybrid, two 100% PV and one diesel only. Uh, the system capacities range from 50 kilowatt to 150 kilowatt peak and as I'm sure you're all aware with mini grids comes some limitations on where you can work. And so the target market is densely populated rural areas which have diverse economic activities which can support higher uses of electricity. So the tariffs, uh, I guess the key principle that we want to take out from uh, Frizz's tariffs is that we're looking to balance commercial and social drivers. Although our local companies are, are commercial by nature, we ourselves are a non-profit. So that in itself means that we're looking to have more on the social aspect of that, but essentially we want to make sure that we're affordable to our market and when you're working as as uh, Charlie mentioned in, in areas where there isn't really an established uh, electricity or s solar energy market then you really need to be uh, accepted and uh, affordable. 
So with that in mind, uh, customer tariffs are designed to be financially sustainable at scale and not to be making a profit in the short term. In some, I will mention that in some of our countries, uh, governments do regulate the tariffs, particularly with regards to mini grids. That's something to keep in mind. Uh, in the case of solar home systems, uh, a customer will pay a, a fixed fee, be it by week, by month, or per season, depending on if you're a farmer or a shop owner, for instance. Uh, it starts at six euros for the S1, the 80 watt peak system, and will go modular, modularly up from there. Payment is generally, in principle, uh, particularly in West Africa, done by cash, although we do accept uh, mobile banking, which is very common in, uh, for instance, East Africa. In the case of mini grids, uh, tariffs are essentially tied to consumption. So along with a, a fixed monthly fee for the connection, uh, customers are charged a euro fee of 38 cents per kilowatt hour. All mini grid customers are also connected to prepaid meters and tariffs to include a provision for lighting. So moving on to our experience in Mali and what was presented in the uh, value chain analysis, uh, our local company there is Yalankura. Um, it's been operating since 2001 uh, when it was established through a joint venture between the, uh, the energy companies Nuon and EDF. Uh, from 2004, uh, Frez has been managing this on behalf of Nuon and in 2008, ownership was officially transferred over to Frez and a staff trust fund of Yalankura. It is currently the only company that is operating mini grids. Uh, as I mentioned, there are 10 mini grids and we have seen significant growth and beyond the growth we've seen, there is a, a large unserved demand, you could say, as well. Uh, we work closely with Amadea, the Rural Electrification, Electrification Agency of Mali, and we have implemented a number of programs with them. We are also in ongoing tariff negotiations with them. Uh, in general, it's, it's going well, but you could say that the tariffs are more on the social than the commercial side in Mali, even with, with our lobbying um, and, and our partnership with our uh, international agencies. But uh, we have had good, ex uh, good results in increasing the tariff uh, in the last few years, and we're working with Amada to sort of uh, show them what what is the tariff that you really need to produce um, you know, financial sustainability of your company and ultimately the, uh, the scaling of the industry in Mali. Uh, there's also, in, uh, I think, what has, has been a real, real win in Mali is our ongoing cooperation with a grid company, a Dutch grid company called Alianda. They work with us to essentially optimize the operating of the grid, uh, as many of you know. Uh, national grids in Africa suffer of grid losses of up to 20 or 30 percent and in implementation our mini grids were no different. So we've worked uh, very well with them to restructure uh, the grids in terms of where are the high energy users, where could we better um, serve them with different cables or simply moving them and uh, it's to date it's been very successful and we've seen grid reductions uh, down to, I believe, 12 and 15 percent of last year. Uh, this customer base is 6,300 as of June 2015. I think that may, in fact, be an error in the uh, slide presented on the website, just to keep that in mind. And this is just a, a wee point I want to, to mention, uh, and this is something Charlie posted uh, very highly on. It was the, the, the energy access ladder. Um, in the case of mini grids, uh, you see this graph which will show the electricity consumption per customer from 2006 to 2014. Uh, in short, we're looking at uh, roughly 10 to 15 percent growth annually. Uh, we've seen much higher consumption during the day, which is in fact a good thing. Um, uh, to be, uh, our systems were actually designed for higher use in the night time, so we did in fact have larger battery banks. But the positive about this is, is that the consumption profiles in general are more complementary to the, the uh, solar energy sources, so it's looking more positive for the uh, ongoing projects in terms of increased capacity without the added expense of large battery banks. We have, due to the, the increase in demand, we have implemented active demand side management strategies and I think it's a, it's a critical element to 
to address this when you're developing a project, to bear in mind that you know once you're there for the long term, you, you really need to manage the demand, but also plan for it. Um, and I think that's often an overlooked fact when it comes to funders and even project developers. So, um, I mean, ultimately we're there to support this growth. We're there for socioeconomic development. So you need to be able to design a project which caters for this. Uh, just briefly, I'll, I'll touch on what we consider uh, factors that have influenced our success to date. And in its core, we believe our business model uh, is, is a key approach to that. As I mentioned, commercial, sustainable and replicable. Uh, that's based over you know, many years of uh, looking at what components we use, how long we want the battery to last, and to basically streamline what we do, uh, which includes using PV, which is a rather robust and proven technology, to, to make sure that it is scalable, that we're actually developing something that does incorporate its local uh, the local setting in terms of how you market to the, the local community, what stakeholders you need to get involved with, but in its core it's scalable. Um, we're looking to obviously grow as much as we can and and we think a commercial approach to that is one element to that and the second is fee for service. Um, for the market segmentation that we're looking to support, uh, they simply can't afford to buy a system, so providing electricity as a service um, and an affordable service is a key element of that. Uh, maintenance and replacement guarantees are also a critical element of our model. Uh, as I mentioned, we're not there for a short-term win. We're there for the long term to, um, as Charlie put it, to, to, to demonstrate what is possible in these regions, to, uh, to, to provide, um, I guess, yeah, real case studies that uh, prove that solar PV can be accepted by the community and, uh, in a sense, pave the way for other operators to come forward. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're looking to support uh, productive use activities, so electric electricity beyond basic lighting and helping people develop income generating activities. Uh, another key element is the, the governance model that Press employs. So every local company has a board of directors, uh, a three-person team that monitors the performance of the company uh, on a monthly basis with four key business indicators. Uh, each company is, of course, um, required to present uh, a business plan for the coming five years on an annual basis. And uh, with that in mind, uh, there is uh, ongoing communication between the, the board of directors, FRES, and, uh, and the local company. Risk management is another critical element, and uh, I think it's important when you're working in uh, in these industries is to, to focus on what you're good at and uh, managing what you're not good at. Uh, looking for the key partners that you need at the local setting, for example, or who you need at the, at the uh, international setting as a lobbying partner, for example, if things get uh, difficult. Um, uh, one example would be the coup d'etat in Mali in 2012. Um, you know, when something like that happens and you're using, um, for example, donor financing, uh, the financing often gets blocked um, due to um, political situations such as that. So uh, with a lot, a lot of uh, strong lobbying support, we were able to, to get the money that we'd already invested. Uh, so uh, I think risk management has been a, a, definitely a, a critical element in our success in working with the technical and uh, legal partners that we need to, to make sure that collectively we're all getting the job done, even if we don't have the expertise in-house. And procurement policy, uh, we, we operate a, a centralised procurement policy here at FRES and the key element of that is that with bulk purchasing we uh, have a higher purchasing power with our uh, suppliers, as well as that we are able to dictate with our technical specifications exactly what components we want. We want high quality components that will last in the field because ultimately you're working in areas which are remote uh, not hugely po densely populated, and so when a battery breaks, you, you don't want to be going out there every uh, every two months, for example. You want a battery that will last five years, and in that sense, you can keep your operational costs as low as possible, and ultimately be more effective at what you're doing. As I mentioned earlier, local ownership is a key element, and making sure that our local employees are, are trained and capable of doing what they do. Um, to date, that has largely been focused on technical 
capacities, but we are seeing an ongoing need to, to have more managerial focused training in the future. Um, and I think it's something I touch on a bit later, but uh, you know, finding qualified staff in some of these remote rural locations is is a difficult challenge to um, to overcome when it comes to uh, uh, making these companies work. Uh, local ownership is also a key element in terms of getting buy-in from your local stakeholders, be them national governments, local authorities, or the, ultimately the the in community. We have partnered with a number of organisations from financial uh, onto technical and legal, fiscal, financial. Uh, as I mentioned, this is part of a risk mitigation policy and uh, particularly in the case of technical, we're, we're a small team here, uh, six of us here in the Netherlands and we work with a lot of uh, paid, but, uh, mainly unpaid uh, volunteers who help us with uh, technical capacities, legal and, uh, and financial as well. So some of the challenges and the lessons learned, um, despite the hype, uh, there's still, I would say, insufficient financing available for the necessary scale up. Of course, there are, I think since uh, the declaration of the decade for sustainable energy for all, we have seen uh, these um, capital markets open up somewhat, but I think in general, uh, it could be argued that uh, a lot of the funding is, is still for demonstration, innovation, uh, pilot projects and uh, it really needs to be a focus on uh, the scale up as well for those people who have proven that um, they have a model that works and they simply and it, and the, the real bottleneck is financing. Uh, with that in mind, um, there is still a need for public support through uh, through grants uh, to, to act as a risk mitigation mechanism, particularly if you want private sector involvement. And I think what I also want to mention was uh, in recent years there's, there's been a real focus on uh, d the development and the opportunity of mini grids in, uh, in particularly Africa as the solution to energy access. Um, of course mini grids have a place and we've had good success with them but they do come with their own challenges and I think um, if financing is flowing to mini grids that's fine, that's great but as long as it's not coming at the expense of other uh, technologies such as solar home systems or solar light each has its place, but um, by no means are they are they um, taking over the other. They operate in different markets, complementary as they are. Uh, some of the challenges on the operational side: uh, sustainable tariff structures are uh, are a key element. Um, when I say this, I particularly mention mini grids because, uh, from a political perspective, uh, as soon as you're operating a grid, you you do come into a lot more um, a lot more difficulties, a lot more hurdles. And some countries have dealt with them, some are trying to deal with them, and some there really are a block for um, for people to go in there and, and actually operate them. Um, another key challenge for us is non-payment, um, be it uh, soft sort of um, soft ways to mitigate that through uh, education and, uh, and strong controls or using technology uh, such as pre payment to com combat that. What we have seen is, um, is in general, I, I don't know if it's our companies or if it's a regional thing, but we have seen higher payment rates in uh, West Africa, I will say that. <laughs> uh, another challenge is, is managing the growth and demand, both in mini grids and solar home systems. Um, of course, uh, increased demand shows that you know, you're, you're doing a good job in a sense, but it also comes with uh, higher investment costs and higher strain on, on your systems and uh, managing that growth, but also planning for it uh, with your uh, financial partners is, is also a, a key challenge. And as I mentioned earlier, qualified staff is another key challenge. One of the opportunities that we, um, Chris, that we see Chris, coming forward. Chris, sorry to interrupt, but um, due to time, would it be possible to wrap up in the next uh, minute? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> uh, very quickly, I think energy efficient appliances are, are where we really need to head in terms of managing this growth and demand. There's a, there's a huge opportunity for it uh, to reduce our costs, but also to enable access to the end user, but currently the distribution channels aren't well defined. Uh, and I will move on. Oh, yeah. Uh, just very briefly, the next steps for Frizz is uh, establishing a new company in Cameroon 
uh, we undertook market assessment this year and hope to have that coming in the, in the coming months. Uh, many grid operations will commence in Guinea-Bissau either at the end of this year or next year and apart from that there is an ongoing focus on uh, optimising the financial performance of our companies as well as the, uh, the technical and economic performance of the mini grids. Uh, quick shout out to our sponsors and partners and with that, questions. All right, thanks so much. Um, and again, sorry for, for kind of rushing things along. We did want to give uh, Michael just a couple minutes um, here to provide sort of some, some wrap up and tying everything back together. So Michael, um, if you could keep it maybe to two minutes and, and no more than that, so we have time for at least a couple questions, that'd be great. Yeah, we'll do, we'll try to do. Thanks to both presenters. I think um, what came out very clearly is how they, with their quite different models operating actually in different market segments, deal with the, with, with the specific situation and how they address the specific uh, challenges. I think uh, what the, the, the formulation that Charlie used, that both of them actually have obviously a catalyzing effect in the geography, in the market segments uh, that they're operating. In terms of uh, how we presented the case studies in our publication, I think actually that both presentations in fact enriched uh, the analysis of the case studies that uh, to the extent that some, some additional things could be added there. But that's what I mentioned earlier, the model can accommodate that and uh, still make uh, recommendations. What I found very interesting to see is how the solar aid uh, value chain ropes in different actors, you know, whereas uh, for the mini grid market, that essentially, uh, you call it full cycle, a vertically integrated uh, value chain. Um, I think also another aspect that came up very clearly in, uh, in, uh, and that I found very relevant in uh, Christopher's presentation is that aspect uh, for mini grids of productive use. It's also often mentioned in the context of anchor uh, business clients, ABC uh, model, uh, as being very important uh, for uh, good revenue um, base for mini grid projects. But then of course also the fact that uh, maybe one can say that whereas mini grids, whereas in, in, in mini grids and in, in, in the solar aid market segment you have the complexities of your business model and of your client side that you need to deal with. And of course in the solar aid market segment for PV you have the regulatory complexity of VAT and of uh, the quality issues and the, go the governance of the quality. But then the problem, <laughs> the challenge for for, for mini grids is that you're dealing with uh, also all kinds of additional uh, regulations uh, that must be in place and that need to be addressed somehow. Last but not least, uh, what uh, Chris, uh, uh, Christopher said in the end, the space. I think that's really important and that's something where still awareness uh, could be greater and needs to be built. Um, that when it comes to electrifying rural areas bringing electricity to those that don't have uh, electricity yet out there. There is a space for all the technologies that are there. There is a space where it makes most sense to extend the grid. There is a space for mini grids and there is a space where neither the grid nor mini grids make sense and uh, where there's a space for uh, uh, standalone systems uh, which could be solar home systems or lanterns. There is even going to be geographical overlap. I have worked for many years, I lived for many years in East Africa myself, I have seen places where there was the grid and there are still some people in those communities that use uh, uh, solar PV home systems or solar lanterns and there's nothing wrong with that. It depends on the affordability and, and, and what is appropriate and what we also see and that's what makes life so interesting I suppose for both those that do business in those market segments as well as those who want to govern and regulate it as well as those who need to support uh, this, the boundaries are shifting. They're in constant uh, flow depending on technological innovation, depending on also business innovation that we see. Uh, it was mentioned the pay as you go systems which have certainly pushed uh, boundaries very uh, dramatically. I would like to leave it at that and also I'm looking forward to questions or comments. Thank you. All right. Um, Thank you very much, Michael, and again, thank you to all of our panelists. Um, we do apologize. Uh, I don't think we have time here uh, to hit any questions, although we did get quite a few questions from the audience. Um, what we will do uh, is we can send those questions out to all of our panelists. 
um, with email addresses for all of the attendees uh, and let the uh, panelists follow up individually on those questions and email uh, email responses uh, to you directly. So don't worry, we will uh, we will uh, do our best to make sure your questions get answered. Uh, just unfortunately, we don't have time here. Um, uh, so with that, um, we'll just move right on into um, a quick survey. Uh, you would go ahead and please answer the question you see there. And the next question coming up. And one last poll question. All right, that, uh, that concludes the survey. And again, um, I'd like to just extend a big, uh, big thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, despite running out of time for questions, um, I think we ha had some great, uh, great content here. And uh, our, the sheer number of questions indicates uh, uh, that it was uh, successful. So uh, anyway, I'd just like to thank everybody again, um, as well as the attendees, for participating in the webinar today. Um, Again, uh, attendees, if you'd like to check out the Solution Center website, uh, you can view the slides uh, as well as find a recording of today's webinar, which will, should be posted hopefully within the week. Um, you'll also find information on other Solution Center uh, webinars uh, and resources on the Solution Center website as well. Uh, additionally, the recording will be posted to the Clean Energy Solutions YouTube channel, uh, where you'll also find recordings of uh, various interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. Uh, we invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about the Solution Center resources and services, including our no-cost policy support. Uh, and with that, uh, we ask that you all uh, enjoy the rest of your day or the evening, as the case may be, depending on where you are. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again at future Clean Energy Solution Center events. Thank you very much. <laughs>